probably go ahead and get started. So thank you all for joining us for the April Biology Seminar. Um, it's with great pleasure that we welcome Dr. Stephanie Dance Barnes as our speaker today. She became the Dean of the College of Science and Health last July, and she's brought with her a real wealth of experience both in cancer biology research and as a champion for equity in higher education. Um, Dr. Dance Barnes earned her PhD in cancer biology from Wake Forest and then did postdoctoral training at UNC Chapel Hill. And after that, she was the Associate Provost and Dean at Winston-Salem State University, where she really worked on enhancing student supports and worked on integrating undergraduate research across the curriculum. Um, she also founded the Women in Science program there to create a welcoming community for female STEM students. In 2019, Dr. Stance Barnes received the Board of Governors Excellence in Teaching Award, an Insight into Diversity Leaders in STEM Award, and the American Association of Cancer Research Minority Serving Institution Faculty Award. Um, she's also a PI on an NSF grant that's designed to expose underrepresented minority third through fifth graders to STEM careers and promote positive STEM identities um, via culturally relevant interventions. And in her lab, she uses genetics, genomics, cell culture, and animal models to understand the molecular biology of different subtypes of breast cancer, particularly focusing on triple negative breast cancer. And I've had limited uh, opportunities to interact with Dr. Dance Barnes to date, but she's jumped into some of our CSH DEI committee meetings. And I can say she definitely is a very thoughtful and creative scientist and with the drive to create um, to, to um, take those thoughts and convert them into action. So we're very pleased to have you with us today. Thank you. And I guess I'll, I'll start by maybe sharing my screen. Let's see. I can maybe get sharing privileges. Let's see, very good. So I want to thank everyone from, for being here today. Um, I, I want to say this is probably the hardest presentation to put together because I really want to share so much with you. And so I, I stuck with the mainly the cancer related uh, topics. Um, but there are an abundance of uh, interests that I have that um, Carolyn mentioned in the intro that Hopefully, if not today, at some point in time, I'll be able to come back and speak to some of those areas as well. But um, the overarching focus or my interest, it, it does involve using genomics, molecular genetics, and cell biology in the characterization of uh, the biological diversity of tumors. And um, my primary interest has been in triple negative breast cancer, but I have done quite a bit of research with lung cancer as well. So I'm actually going to talk about both of it today. And so um, the overarching goal is to use this knowledge um, to inform or better improve more targeted therapies towards these uh, specific subtypes of cancers. And so I'm trying to move my panel so I'm not seeing faces as I'm presenting. So the two tracks that I'm really gonna speak about today are one, some of the mouse, the mouse model for you know, non-small cell lung cancer that I've developed in the past. And I've used this model to um, have a better understanding of non-small cell lung cancer, um, uh, uh, chemopreventive type opportunities as well as um, introducing you to um, my work with um, triple negative breast cancer. And um, for those of you that are not aware, triple negative breast cancer is called that because uh, this particular cancer doesn't possess those um, pro prognostic markers that, um, or diagnostic mar markers that most breast cancers do, which are the estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 receptors which really provide um, more insight into how those types of cancers can be better treated. And so this particular cancer doesn't have these markers, so it's very difficult to treat and provide interventions and therapies. So I'm, I'm gonna start actually by talking about lung cancer. Um, 
one of the reasons why I actually um, decided to work with this cancer initially is because as you can see here, um, as it relates to cases, it's the second leading uh, cause of cancer amongst men and women. And as it relates to deaths, is the leading cancer killer in men and, and women. And what's even more interesting, the, there are tremendous disparities here um, as it relates to African Americans. What we find is that um, uh, uh, African Americans have a much higher incidence of developing lung cancers. And even more striking is that the su survival rate of African Americans is really, really poor. And this is primarily because in a lot of cases, um, these lung cancers are diagnosed very late stage. And it, there are a number of reasons why this may be the case. It could be because of um, not going to the physician in a timely manner, or in some instances, we found that there are some um, ge genetic um, or genotypical properties that predispose African Americans to more aggressive forms of this, of this cancer. But as you can see, as it relates to um, survival, um, there's quite a big gap between um, Blacks and um, Whites and Hispanics, and that gap really hasn't closed over um, the, the years. And so when we look at probably the most prominent type of lung cancer, which is what most of my work has been with, um, uh, non-small cell lung cancer makes up about 85% of total lung cancers, with the other being small cell lung cancer. And um, the focus of my research is actually the ad adenocarcinoma form, which makes up about 40% of non-small cell lung cancers. And with uh, adenocarcinomas, typically with these cancers, they start in the glandular cells of the, of the lung. And this is where we have most of those secretions occurring. And that, that kind of makes sense because these cancers are really highly associated with smoking and you have a lot of secretions because of the inflammation um, Typically, that is generated when individuals smoke and some of the side effects from smoking. Um, and so these areas are typically the smaller airways or the alveoli. And so um, what we find that's really quite striking with these cancers, um, people can go quite a bit of time with a high tumor burden, up to about 80% sometime, and not even realize they have lung cancer until they're really presenting with extreme symptoms. And that's part of the reason why as well, because you can really um, go quite a bit of time with quite a bit of your the lung capacity compromise and not really knowing it. And so by the time you get into the clinic, um, is too far gone at that point. So a lot of my work has been dealing with not necessarily curing cancer because lung cancer is actually one of the most curable cancers if it's caught early. It's really about how can we keep the cancer at a state in which someone can live quite a long life with, with the cancer. Um, in my work with uh, non-small lung cancer, specifically I focused on KRAS mutations and what we find with uh, KRAS mutations is that um, it is really predominant in a lot of the non-small cell lung cancers. It makes up about 30% of adenocarcinomas um, of the lung um, that are driven by these types of KRAS mutations. And um, these mutations can actually really inform prognosis and response to treatment. And so a big part of what um, my work focused and focuses on is developing models to, to better assess and to figure out um, uh, various chemopreventive and chemotherapeutic strategies. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, familiar with RAS, RAS plays a critical role in signal transduction and cell growth and differentiation. And so it, it really is a very important gene as it relates to cell proliferation, growth and development, and is a really big target as it relates to lung cancer. Um, 
just a little bit about the function of RAS because that will give you more insight into the type of mutation or the construct that I created for this particular model. And so when we think about the normal function of RAS, it typically cycles between an active and an inactive form. When it's in the inactive form, it's bound to a GDP, which is guanosine 5-triphosphate. Five, five um, that's a mouthful. And um, when it's in the active form, it's bound to GTP, which is the, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. When it's in its inactive form, it's bound to GDP, which is the diphosphate. And when it's bound to the GTP, which is the triphosphate, that's the active form. And so what typically happens in normal cells is that there's a transient activation due to external um, signals that essentially allows for these guanine nucleotide exchange factors to um, initiate the switch from the GTP to the GDP um, bound form. But for this to happen, for RAS to actually go from the GTP or the active form, there has to be participation from a GTPase activating protein. And um, what typically happens is there's a mutation um, in RAS that allows for this hydrolyzation to not occur in, with this GTPase activating pr protein, which then keeps um, RAS in this GTP or active form. And that's what lends itself to cancer. And so what I did for this particular model was um, it's a bi-transgenic um, uh, conditional model is actually reversible and I'll talk to you a little bit about that but you essentially you're taking two separate mouse lines one has the CCSP reverse um, TET transactivator and another one has uh, the TET OCMB that's actually attached to the the target allele and when you cross these mice you get a double progeny animal that um, will contain the, the targeted allele and then also this TETO CMB um, uh, promoter construct together in an animal. And what you wouldn't want to happen is for this gene or this mutation to already be turned on because then you really can't assess um, as effectively as possible the impact of this gene on um, this particular animal and the development of the, the tumors, you really wouldn't have an opportunity to really control that assessment. And so what you can do in a very controlled way is introduce doxycycline, um, which is essentially, um, uh, it is a cycling that is comparable to the tetracycline but we use doxycycline instead because it's more stable and we can actually put it in the mouse, mouse's drinking water. And what that does, once you introduce doxycycline to the drinking water of the animals, um, it allows for that reverse tet, tra reverse tet transactivator to bind to that TETOS um, CMV promoter, which then allows for the constitutive expression of that mutant KRAS. And um, at that point, is targeted to the lung and the hope and expectation is is that these animals will develop lung tumors um, within the lung with that um, particular KRAS mutation. Um, this is just a, a bit of data that shows what happens when you expose these animals to um, doxycycline and over time what we find is in a dose dependent map, map manner that you have an increase in um, uh, KRAS expression in, in these animals. And for this particular treat set of treatments, the mice received anywhere from 25 to 100 to 500 micrograms per, per milliliter of doxycycline in their water. And um, the amount of expression, which was assessed through real-time PCR, um, as I stated before, was dose dependent. And this was also comparable to the tumor multiplicity in, in these animals as well, where um, when we actually excise the lungs and review the lungs for um, visible um, lesions um, and we physically count them, um, the amount of tumors correlated or it increased in a dose-dependent manner. 
So just to put everyone on the same page, so we can develop an understanding of how this model can be best used to understand how carcinogenesis occurs as it relates to this type of lung cancer. Um, I wanna make sure everyone understands how car carcinogenesis works. And typically it, it happens in three stages. You have initiation, promotion, and progression. And initiation is when you have that initial genotoxic carcinogen type event that causes that initial um, mutation. And in the situation of this particular model that I've introduced you to today, that initiating event is the activation or the turning on or the overexpression of that mutant KRAS in these mice. And so what that now does is it sets things in place for the development of these particular types, um, this particular type of, of um, lung carcinogenesis. However, what we want to then begin to see is what sort of events, what um, molecular changes, what um, uh, types of therapies or even chemopreventive uh, uh, opportunities are there if we have a better understanding of what happens downstream with promotion and progression. So at this point, we've only introduced an initiating event which will give you, um, as you'll see here, um, in out of order, because I wanted to show you what the tumors look like. But initially, you'll see what's referred to as, as hyperplastic lesions. And um, I'll talk to you about that in just a bit. But just to give you a better idea of how this model works, I've already shown you, once you introduce the doxycycline to the drinking water of these animals. And this is typically done at around eight weeks of age. And so at that point, they have that initial exposure um, and the expression of that mutant KRAS is now occurring. And so then what we want to do at this point is now introduce, as you see here, some sort of promoting event. What is now gonna push it along? And what is maybe um, comparable to what we will see in an individual that would maybe be smoking cigarettes. And so what we did was we introduced these animals at the night week to something called BHT, which is butylated hydroxytoluene, which is, um, it causes inflammation. And so the, the proposed model is that this BHT will now induce inflammation, which is kind of that second hit and that promoting event and um, for the, from that point on, the animals are either just getting docs alone, a combination of docs and BHT, or in some instances, the third treatment now becomes where the student, where <laughs> the mice <laughs> are actually exposed to some chemopreventive agent. And there were two uh, chemopreventive agents that um, we proposed would be feasible for this particular model. And so we introduce either Celindac or curcumin. And they both have um, promising um, outcomes as it relates to certain cancers, particularly colon. And so we thought we, we would see something comparable in this model as well. And so um, Celindac is uh, anti-inflammatory. It works through the COX-2 COX pathway where it is, it, it's able to um, inhibit COX-1 and 2. And in essence, it, it may uh, correlate to uh, inhibiting tumor pro progression. And so the other treatment was curcumin. And um, curcumin, it does have an ability to block the cell cycle and also accelerate apoptosis. And like I said, these, these, both of these agents have, have promising results in other types of cancers. And so those are the sets of treatments that these animals would receive. So before I introduce the results to you, I wanna kind of walk you through some of the outcomes that you might see with these treatments. So as I mentioned early on, with early stage um, expression of KRAS, it's an, it's an initiating event. And so the thought is that the 
expectation, we would have some form of perhaps hyperplastic change. And the tricky thing about hyperplasias is that it is increased number of cells or proliferation is going on, but under the microscope, these cells still look absolutely the same. And so what's dangerous about that, if you're observing pathology and you're looking at the cells, they look normal. And so if there's some promoting event later, you still have these normal looking hyperplastic cells there, it can then progress to something more severe later. Um, with the promoting agents, and like I said, when we think about um, smoking and cancer, there are a number of um, promoting agents that may come into play. Um, uh, and they're escaping me right now. So I had a brain fart there. But um, when you think about smoking, there are some that are considered initiators like your, your benzenes and your nitrosamines. But then um, there are a, a number of inflammatory agents that can come along and then promote these uh, 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 tumors onto a, a more even a more progressive state and ultimately it can result in um, uh, metastasis. And so I, I want, want you to keep all of this in your mind because in some instances, um, with the treatments, we're going to see where hyperplasias are produced, which are those early stage benign lesions. Adenomas are also benign as well, but they have distinct um, features um, from a pathological standpoint. And then you have adenocarcinomas, which are tumorigenic and have the ability to eventually metastasize. Additionally, what happens with these promoting events, you have other genes mm -hmm. downstream mm -hmm. that could possibly be um, interrupted, like some of your tumor suppressors, like P53 or RB. And um, these tumor suppressor genes typically play a big role in regulating apoptosis. And so just to give you an idea about um, how um, these mice that were induced with the docs reacted, and what some of our results were, I've compiled this, this figure. And really on the top, you're seeing average tumor multiplicity. And initially when looking at these results, it, it didn't really mean very much because it's like, it makes no sense whatsoever when we we're, were initially looking at it. And it was like, okay, you're giving the animals docs. And then when you're looking at the surface tumors, we're seeing quite a number of tumors that we can physically count when they're getting DOCS. Um, when we give them DOCS and Selindac, which is that anti-inflammatory, we, um, we see a slight increase in the number of tumors. It wasn't statistically significant, but we didn't expect to see anything very different because they haven't gotten the inflammatory um, agent, which was the BH BHT. When we actually give the mice the dots and the BHT, that actually made sense. We had, we had an increase in tumor multiplicity and um, that, that kind of it reconciled itself, it made sense. When we gave the animals the, the, the dots, the BHT and the Selindac, we did see a significant decrease, but not to the degree we would have expected, but it actually made more sense when we actually staged the lesions or looked at the pathology of them. And then lastly, when we actually looked at the impact of the curcumin, which is an alternative anti-inflammatory, what we saw was that um, those animals that got the dots and curcumin, pretty much it looked like the curcumin was almost acting the same as the BHT, which was kind of concerning because this is a therapeutic in colon cancer. And then when we um, included the, the BHC, there really was no difference. But where it became interesting, it was when we actually looked at the stages of the lesion. And along the right, what you're seeing is the dark panels are gonna be your hyperplasias. If you remember from what I showed you before, those are those early stage lesions. The second stripe bars are your adenomas. So it's like promotion or second phase. And then you have those adenocarcinomas, um, uh, which are represented by the clear bar. 
And so what was very interesting, when the animals were just getting docked, the majority of the lesions were hyperplastic and some adenomas. And when we gave them the BHT, which is that promoting agent, a number of the hyperplastic lesions um, were diminished. We were actually seeing more of the later stage tumors. So now it begins to make sense, even though when you're physically counting tumors on the surface, that, may, that didn't really matter in this case, it's really about the pathology. And then when we looked at the treatment with the Celindac, we actually saw where there was a diminishment of the adenomas and more of a shift back to the hyperplasias. And we didn't expect to see any change with the DS. It looked comparable to what we saw with just the docs alone. But this is where it gets interesting. And this is where it really um, contradicts the literature as it relates to how curcumin works with other cancers. And what we saw here was that the curcumin actually um, promoted tumor genesis here where we were having or seeing more severe tumor stages where there were more ad adenocarcinomas as well as adenomas. And so that became very interesting. And part of the thought thinking was that there's something about um, perhaps already damaged lungs or those that um, have some form of inflammation going on that perhaps the curcumin is actually exacerbating the situation and promoting these tumors. And so for me, as it relates to this lung cancer model, I'm thinking about where can I take that here at DePaul? And so first and foremost, I think this is a very good model to continue methodically mimicking non-small cell lung cancer and thinking about how we can continue to understand the biology of these cancers and look at more targeted therapies. Um, because it is a mouse model and I don't know how equipped I'll be to do that, um, I also want to look at taking um, the tumor cells from these models and actually culturing them and maybe doing some things in cell culture. Um, but what we were able to see, and just quickly, because we did look at some of the, the genetic changes that did occur in um, um, molecular events. Um, so as it related to DOC treatment, going from the low to the high dosages, we did see um, differential changes. So when we looked at sort of the mid and the high doses, we, we saw things that, that made sense and can help inform how we can then be, begin perhaps looking at ways of even developing um, alternate types of mouse models that um, exploit some of these other pathways. So for instance, in, in this particular model, at the higher dose concentra DOCS concentrations, we saw where there was more inhibition of P53, which is really getting at um, diminished apoptosis, which does lead to more severe tumors. Um, we saw increased levels of surviving. And then we also, so saw, also saw dose-dependent decreases in caspase, which is also linked to apoptosis and how um, um, further supporting the diminishment of apoptosis in this model. And then also a dose-dependent increase in cyclin D1, which is leading to a more progressive phenotype in these animals as you increase KRAS um, uh, copy number. So I'm going to stop there in talking about lung cancer. And for the next bit, I'm going to switch and talk about breast cancer a little bit because this is this is my my more passionate area, but I, I do. Um, want to make sure that I'm making you aware of all of my interests. And so um, I wanted to start with lung cancer, but um, where the abundance of work has been done has been in the area of breast cancer. And this data here probably shouldn't be surprising to anyone, but as it relates to new cases, breast cancer is the leading um, uh, uh, the, is leading among women in cases. And as it relates to deaths, it is the second leading cancer killer in women right behind lung cancer, which is what we saw before. And so what has informed my work was really some 
fundamental work that was done in my postdoctoral lab before I even got into that lab. But one of the distinctions and one of the uh, key findings that Dr. Peru and his team was able to uh, come, uh, decipher was that cancer or breast cancer is not a single disease. If you think, you know, 20 years ago, it was like, oh, you have breast cancer. You're just thinking it's all the same. But one, one thing that he was really able to show quite eloquently is that breast cancer is actually a very heterogeneous disease. And it consists of at least five to six subtypes. And I'm saying at least five to six because even when I was a part of his lab, we were able to even um, begin to identify and pinpoint a new subtype, which is the Claudine Lowe. Um, but I wanted to show you this data just so you can be introduced to, first of all, the microarray technology, which um, I'm, I'm going to show you a bit more of these heat maps as I move forward. But as you can see along the top, all of these little hash marks represent different samples, and these are cl um, different uh, clinical samples. Um, being at UNC Chapel Hill, of course, we work quite co collaboratively with clinicians and with our bench sciences. And so um, these um, clinical samples were readily av available. And so what you see here is a, essentially a profile analysis of various types of breast tumors from different patients. And what we were able to do through um, microarray analysis, well, I wasn't here for this, but I'll show you subsequent work where I was present, where you can see that these particular subtypes um, definitely cluster together and very distinctive. And what's even more striking that as you look at these particular uh, subtypes of breast cancer and the outcomes for these patients is very striking when looking at the plot that it, it informs their survival rate. And so for instance, when you're looking at the basal-like um, cancers, the survival rate for that group was much less. And then, um, we also have the Claude and Lowe group, which um, I'll talk about a bit a little later, has an even poorer survival rate. And so this points to the necessity of using tools like this because one, it does allow you to get more insight into um, prognosis. And then later on, um, I'll show you how we can begin to use this technology to provide more informed decisions about um, treatment. So just so everyone understands when we're looking at microarrays, um, essentially when you're conducting this type of work, you have a glass slide or in some instances a plate. And on this glass slide, what you're gonna find um, embedded on it are um, a set of sequence tagged CDNAs. Um, and then from that point, you're taking your experimental uh, tissue, you're gonna isolate the RNAs from those tissues, and they're gonna essentially be labeled. And in regards to this particular um, type of microarray, we'll say they're tagged with a red fluorescent dye. And then you have your control, which is typically tied, uh, tagged with a green. And so they're then hybridized to the microarray, and then with laser emission, um, you're able to decipher expression. And so when you're seeing red, that means upregulation. When you're seeing green, that's down. And when it's um, black, it's constitutive expression, which means it's not really a change between the control and the experimental. And so the, the type of breast cancer that I predominantly work with is basal-like, and it's actually this group that I've highlighted here. And just to give you some idea of how to look at a microarray, which this, this tells you something from an illustrative standpoint, but really the, ma the magic happens on the computational side. And I'm not a computational person, 
So after you actually run the, the microarrays, you hand the, the data off to someone else that's able to do the analysis and spit something back out to you to tell you what you actually, the experiment that you actually ran made sense. And so what you can see from this particular profile is that, and keep in mind with this uh, 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 microarray, all across the top are hundreds of samples. What you're looking at along this column, each row represents a different gene. And it's, it's way more genes than I have um, highlighted here. I just pulled out a few that were relevant to me. And so for each row and then for each sample, there's gonna be a color change. And so the other cool piece is they're gonna be hierarchically clustered. And so the more related the, the samples are, the closer they cluster together. And so all these guys close, cluster together and so they all have a similar profile. And you can see, for instance, here, um, we have, uh, and I, I highlighted this so you can see it. So all these genes that are along this row, they're, they're mainly related to proliferation. And you can see for this basal-like set of tumors that this whole area is red, which says to me, that the expression in these proliferative for these proliferative genes is just turned completely up and it's the same or similar for all these types of tumors but it's just not enough for that to be the case for them to cluster together there's a, another type of uh, subtype is called luminal so there are luminal markers and so as you can see here these basal like tumors this whole area is green so that means they're not expressing this luminal set of genes that are, are associated with this luminal tumor. And so you see that this area is green. And um, there are various other genes that we look at as well. When we think about basal light, they're associated with um, keratin promoters. And so regulation of those guys are up. But as you can see, because all of these um, uh, samples or um, specimens uh, essentially have the same um, expression profile, they cluster together. And so what makes that very interesting and exciting, if you're looking at this and these are patients and they all have the same profile, let's think about how we can potentially um, uh, provide targeted treatments based on uh, uh, the various uh, alterations that we're seeing with their tumors. And so before I run out too much time, I want to make sure that I get through everything. Um, but as I mentioned, the focus of my research is basal-like breast cancer. And you, you see me using that interchangeably with triple negative. And that's because really, for the most part, basal-like and triple negative tumors overlap in regards to some of their features. Um, but I've already mentioned with triple negative breast cancers, um, you know, it's the absence of the estrogen receptors, progesterone receptor, and the HER2. And then I've already mentioned in regards to prognosis being poor and in regards to uh, 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 diagnoses, once someone has a recurrence, there's a risk of reoccurrence within three years of I'm sorry, once someone um, goes into remission, there's a risk of recurrence within three years of remission with this type of tumor, which makes it even scarier. But um, this is mainly because, back to what I showed you with lung cancer, what typically happens is you have these hyperplastic, and what we're beginning to see, I showed you those clawed and low type tumors earlier. There are clawed and low type tumors that have actually um, been shown to have precursor type properties that are maybe hiding out and looking normal. And so you think you've cleared the disease and you actually not. And then what becomes even more terrible is that um, there's an increased mortality rate within five years after that remission. And so this is, um, just something visually to put the triple negative and the basal light into pers perspective for you. 
um, really by far and large the triple and basal light tumors they overlap one another and so you can see with a lot of the literature they're 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 talked about um, sometimes synonymously additionally what was really striking about triple negative breast cancer for me um, was the impact on African American women because it's not just um, an older person disease. We found that with triple negative breast cancer, actually the younger premenopausal women are more susceptible to developing triple negative breast cancer and have poor out outcomes because it's a, a very aggressive disease. Um, additionally, um, when we think about um, uh, some of the other issues that I mentioned before, um, just like with lung cancer, these diseases are being diagnosed more later stage, and therefore it, it leaves very little time for um, therapies to be um, productive. So just a little bit more background before I introduce you to um, the last model that I wanna mm -hmm. show you today. And I wanna make sure everyone's aware of P53, which is a tumor suppressor gene and um, it plays a part in um, promoting apoptosis and it also plays a role in DNA repair. And so essentially when, when cells have damage, if they can't be repaired, P53 is the gene that does the job to get rid of those damaged cells. And so the thing that we find with a lot of triple negative breast cancers is that P53 is either mu mutated or damaged or knocked out, which means you have a loss of P53 function, which leads to genomic instability and ultimately cancer. Um, another gene that's very relevant for what I'm gonna show you next is BRCA1. And BRCA1 is uh, also uh, another, it's a DNA repair type gene, and it plays a role in also cell arrest and also cell death. Um, if the repair can't happen. And what we find once again in these triple negative breast cancer that BRCA1 function is uh, either completely knocked out or blocked. And so what that leads to is more genomic instability and cancer. And so with this work, I took that knowledge and I developed a, a, a model a Crelox recombination mouse model that essentially contained um, at the end mice that had um, P53 and BRCA1 deficiencies. And <laughs> I won't go through the long story of how you make these constructs, but it takes a long time. And you have to do a series of matings where you're starting with one mouse that has the K14 and that's that keratin promoter to, sure, to ensure that the, the mutations or the, the knocking out of that P53 and BRCA1 is occurring, occurring in those mammary cells. And then you actually have another construct or a, a mouse line where it has the P53 and BRCA1 that are bracketed or will ultimately be flopped. And so when you cross them, you get a combinations of outcomes, but it's not until that third set of readings where you actually end up with animals that have a combination of the K14 pre, which then targets uh, the P53 and the BRCA1 and it flocks those genes out. And you essentially have a, a mouse line that is P53 and BRCA1 um, deficient. Um, was not an easy task. I actually attempted to use another promoter before I used K14, I actually used K5. And because these keratin promoters, it targets the skin and other places other than the mammary, these guys actually turned out not so cool where they didn't have hair. And in a lot of instances, the mammary glands were underdeveloped, which is why I ultimately went with the K14 promoter after trial and error. And so this is just an example, one poor mouse that actually is has the K14 um, uh, with the P53 and BRCA1 deficiency. And it took 
about five to six months to, to get an animal like this. And um, that's, that's not very efficient. And that meant that I would be taking a lot of time do, to do this work. And so what I then decided to do was to excise the tumor and create a single cell suspension from those tumors from the primary mouse and inject them into nude mice. And what that allowed for was essentially uh, an in vivo model in this nude animal where we can then do treatments in this nude animal that's now been injected with the cells that came from the primary. And what's, what's also good, we can culture these cells and then ultimately use them in cell culture as well. And um, just to, to show you, it's a lot easier process. This is 12 days post treatment as opposed to five months. And we actually do pathology to show distinctions between the primary versus the, 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 the single cell um, transplants and everything was uh, comparable. And so from there, we did more microarray analysis on these newly um, constructed uh, constructs or um, mice that, and these were the transplants. So um, the data that you're seeing is not from those primary tumors, but it's from the tumors that were injected into those nude animals. And so from those microarrays, and these are the same sets of data, and I'm not gonna go through all the different genes, but this is just showing you where we compared our particular mouse line to other uh, established mouse lines. And so, and this is the microarray data from that. And this is the same, it's a duplicate figure. It's just outlined where the particular samples fail in um, this microarray. And what we were able to pretty much deduce from this was that um, there was high expression of the basal like tumors, which was good. So great, we created a model that um, definitely expressed these basal associated genes. The luminal light -like genes were um, not, not expressed or were at low expression. We did have some um, uh, mice, I'm sorry, transplant uh, tumors that um, did have clawed and low expression. And these were um, outliers, but they're very interesting because it got us to thinking they, they, they still exist in the same population as these other um, tumor cells. And so we're beginning to explore the Claudin tumors a bit more because the thought is, is that these may be some form of precursors to basal-like tumors and they're just being missed and they could um, be promoted to something more aggressive down the line. And so of course we had highly proliferative genes and then um, uh, what was clear is that there was diversity or we were able to show diversity across these um, various types of models um, using microarray. There were, were also other things that stood out and I'm not gonna go through all these genes because of time, but um, uh, we were able to do sub subsequent other anal analyses to look at copy number and alterations and so forth. and um, it really allowed us to begin to think more about how to um, introduce some form of therapies. And so you remember I, I mentioned that um, these mice were BRCA1 deficient. And so as a therapy, we introduced uh, ABT888, which is a PARP inhibitor. And so as we mentioned, as I mentioned before, BRCA1 is responsible for uh, correcting repair these guys are deficient anyway. And so because BRCA1 is not there, you have these damaged cancer cells that are allowed to essentially go crazy because they're not in check. And so you have this PARP, PARP inhibitor that we introduce. And as you can see from uh, 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 these, this, the, the graph here where we were actually looking at uh, the number, I'm sorry, the, the, the tumor burden over time, it was diminished in the, the PARP inhibited group as compared to all other treatments. 
And so this was really promising because it let us think um, we can do more target therapies based on the types of gene mutations that we were seeing. And additionally, what was really interesting was that we did um, dual treatments. So we have carboplatin and um, paclitaxel, which are typically used uh, separately um, to treat various types of um, human basal-like tumors. And so we did them in combination with our particular model. And what we saw in our model in which we had BRCA1 and P53 deficiency, that using um, carboplatin and paclitaxel in combination is that the mice survived uh, uh, much, the survival rate, I'm sorry, <laughs> was much better for, for our treated animals as compared to the untreated. And so when you're looking at this figure, the treated is in the purple and the untreated was in the black. And these are our particular experimental groups. And as you can see, those that were untreated um, basically lived only 20 days and those that were untreated lived a substantial amount of time. And what we saw was that the tumor burden was actually reduced as well. And so I'm gonna stop sharing because I know I went over a bit of time and didn't leave a whole lot for questions, but just in essence, what's next? Getting my lab reestablished here at DePaul and setting up an opportunity to perhaps do work with uh, these particular models in culture and not mice right away, because I do have these um, tumor cells isolated to work in culture. And then um, I would like to secure funding to get a postdoc to help in this process. And then also, which I didn't present mm -hmm. today, but I have um, uh, a lot of work going on right now with the ITES grant, and I wanna continue to work on that so I can form a better foundation to um, have it tied to what I'm doing here. But I'll stop there. All right, thank you very much. We still have a couple minutes for questions. So if anyone has a question, feel free to raise your hand or unmute. I have a question. Yes, Margaret. Hi, this is Margaret. Um, I'd say this is for the students, but really it's just for me. I can't, I can't blame it on anybody else. Can you tell me more about clotted? So I did a quick Google, but like what, um, what does it do in the cell normally? Why relations to cancer and tumor genesis? Yeah, so with Claudin, it's interesting. Like it really has to do like these precursor cells. And so um, it plays a part in that, um, uh, the, the EMT, the mesocomal transmission, uh, transitioning. And so what we found is with these Claudin cells, um, for whatever reason, it is linked to poor prognosis because they don't have necessarily the traditional markers and they're being overlooked. And so our thought is that there's some switch that at some point in time may um, promote or induce them to actually flip to something even more aggressive down the line. And so it's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, the, the work that I was doing before I left was in cell culture where we, we actually cultured the, the Claude and Lowe cell line because a lot of the work that I showed today was just the, the ones with the basal-like properties. But we just started doing more work with the Claudin. And so I, I really don't have a whole story for it yet, but hopefully I will soon. It's really interesting. Thank you. Tim? Hey, Tim. It's a nice job of the presentation. You mentioned um, students being involved in your research. Is it, do you get a sense of, you know, it sounds like it's pretty technical work. Is that a difficult transition to get the students trained up to be able to work with you or can they kind of transition in pretty easily? It, kind of works it, you do it, is, it is not difficult work and I'm actually going to share my screen really bit 
just really quick so I want that I didn't get a chance to show this to you but um, for instance one of my students or a set of my students looked at dial disulfide which is um, uh, a garlic derivative that's been promising in a lot of cancers and they've actually done studies where they've been able to assess the impact of this particular agent in the cell line that I mentioned today to show that there's actually a decreased viability of these cancer cells by ex exposing them to um, certain levels of the dial disulfide. And this is in cell culture. So this wasn't in the animal model as well. And then another aspect was um, because I did do a lot of um, uh, cell uh, mouse work before, what I attempted to do was develop uh, or have them develop assays with soft auger, which mimics what you would kind of see in vivo. And they've been doing, or what was previously being done by my students was um, doing comparative studies in soft auger between um, established cell lines and our you know, experimental line. And we already see that in, in soft auger that these P53 and BRCA1 deficient tumors are really off the chain as it relates to progressiveness as compared to other established lines. And then they've also done some karyotyping where they looked at polypoidy, uh, I'm sorry, poidy as it relates to um, chromosome number in um, the experimental cell line as compared to other uh, established lines in normal. And so I don't think it's difficult at all. It is when, it, you're at an undergraduate institution, which is where I primarily was. And so you have to start really basic with the cell culture. And so I always try to have them take the courses and things either in advance or while they're in my lab. But um, I, I've had good outcomes with students. Great, thanks. Do we have any other questions? Um. So I, I was curious, um, so I'm in chemistry and I actually collaborate with Dr. Um, with a few people, but uh, Dr. Raj is looking at, I think it's MBM, um, it's a triple negative line. Mm -hmm. So are there, are there big differences between different triple negative lines or are they like, you know, is, is this what, this one compared to like the, the MBM, with like how would you expect to see differences or similarities? Some, some of them are very similar, but then w once again, it's still a, a mouse model. And so it depends on what the original constructs look like. And so it's, it's never really apples to apples, but some of the data is comparable. Mm -hmm. um, in my previous lab, I actually didn't do any comparisons with that particular line, um, but with other lines where either P53 or BRCA1 were de deficient on their own. We looked at comparisons uh, that way to see if there was something special about those targeted pathways. Um, but yeah, I, that is something that you want to keep in mind because mouse, mouse models never really recapitulate what we see in people. And then the other thing was you're using carboplatin. Was there any specific reason just the, the this drug? Carboplatin at the time, yeah. it, it is a standard yeah. treatment or care um, in the clinic. And so we're looking at, um, you know, combined therapies to see if it could be something more synergistic. Yeah. And there's, so there's, because I'm, I'm a platinum chemist and I make platinum complexes. And so carboplatin is like the second generation, but there's some newer generation platinum complexes that are being like, mm. so I don't know if it'd be something that you'd be interested in screening various um, complexes against these lines. Absolutely. Um, and I have, I still am collaborating with, with my collaborator at UNC and he's, he's so excited for me to get things set back up because not only with the therapies, but the different types of mouse lines, like we're in the process of making mice that are deficient for not just P53 and BRCA, but RB and other combinations to see if we can really start nailing down what the, 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 the most or best targeted pathways for interventions are.